So we were really thrilled last fall that the Harvard Business School came out with their report on competitiveness and it was about problems unsolved and a nation divided, demonstrating that our broken government is the number one problem obstructing economic progress in our country. Well, this year, uh, Michael Porter and Harvard Business School have doubled down on this subject and partnered up with former CEO Catherine Gale, and they're also talking about the solutions to the problem. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Michael Porter is an economist, researcher, author, advisor, speaker, and teacher, and one of the world's most influential thinkers on management and competitiveness. The author of 19 books and over 130 articles, he is the Bishop William Lawrence University Professor at Harvard Business School and the director of the school's Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness, which was founded in 2001 to further his work and research. Catherine Gale is an American business leader, entrepreneur, and political reformer. She was the president and CEO of her family-owned company, Gale Foods. Previously, she has served as vice president at Bernstein Investment Research and Management, special assistant to Chicago's Richard Daly for technology and economic development, director of information technology services at Chicago Public Schools, and director of organizational development at Oracle Corporation. She also served as a member of the Board of Directors of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, a role she was nominated to by President Barack Obama in 2010. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Michael and Catherine. Please take it away. Sarah, thank you. Are we on? No, You're on. Great, Sarah. Uh, Michael and I are thrilled to be here. Now we've got 20 minutes before our 10 minutes of questions, so we're going to go fast. I do want to invite everybody on the call to, if you're interested after our 20 minutes, to get the full story by taking a look at our report, which you can find online by Googling why competition in the politics industry is failing America. Now, just quick background on this. Uh, as Sarah said, Michael is the inventor of industry structure and competition thinking. And as the co-chair of the US Competitiveness Project, he encountered firsthand the challenges that our political system are, is creating for the economy. And I, as a former CEO and a political innovation activist, activist, encountered these same problems. So Michael and I came together in order to use the tools of industry analysis, the tools of competitive thinking that Michael invented to actually analyze the political industry, to analyze politics as the business that it is. And What's really important to note is that from the start, we were very clear that we wanted our analysis to lead to action, a strategy for action. We didn't simply want to add to the distressing and depressing commentary about politics, even if we could put a new light on what was going wrong. We felt it was most important to understand what was going wrong if it could only lead to what therefore could we do to make it go right. So here's what we're gonna do for you today, give you a quick overview of the framework and of our analysis. And we're also going to overview very quickly the concrete strategy for the transformational change and then we'll take some questions. So I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you all for uh, inviting us to be part of this uh, launch uh, call in this exciting new group. And we wish you well and uh, look forward to working with you uh, going forward. And as Catherine said, uh, uh, you know, the last thing I thought I would ever do is, is end up working on politics. Uh, but uh, through our work uh, at the U.S. Competitiveness Project at HBS, which I co-led, which has been going on for five or six years, it became clear that actually the political system was now the major constraint uh, facing the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. This is one of the charts that we, uh, we, we had in the report that Sarah uh, referred to. And, uh, what it shows is, is uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S. as a business environment. And um, the good news is we have a lot of strengths still in the green quadrant of this chart. But we are facing compelling and eroding, uh, uh, further eroding weaknesses in a whole variety of fundamental areas that have a profound impact on the economy. Uh, and you see those and things we all know, like logistics infrastructure, tax code, uh, the healthcare system, K-12 edu education. And uh, as, we, as we did this work, uh, we sort of developed an action plan about what we needed to do to, to deal with these fundamental weaknesses once we documented them. And um, we actually uh, discovered to our uh, shock and dismay that although everybody agreed 
with the suggestions, uh, the things we needed to do. And by the way, this was also public officials in Washington. Uh, uh, we discovered that really the U.S. has made no progress on virtually any of these areas in decades. I mean, not just a year or two, not just one administration, but for multiple decades. The tax code, for example, the corporate tax code has not been significantly revised for 30 years. Meanwhile, other countries are refining and improving uh, their tax codes, their infrastructure, their education systems. We're falling farther and farther behind. I've also done substantial work on the social agenda um, through the, the framework of what we call the Social Progress Index, which is a way of benchmarking countries on social performance. And we found the same thing happening. We found that in most of the important areas of social performance, the U.S. is declining. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that as we did the polling of our alumni, we discovered that we, we threw the political system on as a potential strength or a potential weakness, and you can see where it came out uh, dead last. Um, so what we've come to believe is the problem in America now in our economy and in our social agenda is not policy. It's not what to do. The problem is getting it done. It's politics. And that was what has really uh, launched this work. Uh, but that turned out to require uh, really a new lens if we were going to truly unpack and understand what was driving this process. So Catherine, uh, take, take, take the stand. Great. So Sarah pointed out that so many of us are concerned that Washington is broken. But what's really critical to understand when we look at the work that Michael and I have done is it turns out that in fact, Washington is not broken. It is delivering exactly what it's been designed to deliver, and it's doing exactly what it's been designed to do. It turns out that the problem is that, shockingly, Washington has not been designed for the benefit of citizens or voters. It's been designed and optimized over time and really hidden from our view for the benefit of private gain-seeking organizations. And these are, for example, our two political parties, which form the core of what we call the duopoly, and their associated industry actors together comprising the political industrial complex. And this political industrial complex is doing just fine. It's critical to understand the US political system is not a public institution. So many of us have a view that Somehow politics is this, exists on its own special plane of altruistic um, you know, behavior, when in fact it really is a private industry. But what's unique about this industry as compared to the industries that most of us are working in day to day is that it sets its own rules. It is its own regulator. And so because of that, the players in the industry are able to advance their own interests and when they do that, it turns out that it's not in the public interest as they move their own agendas forward. There's no independent regulation. In any other industry, we might see at this point in time, based on the behavior of the actors in this industry, that there would be an antitrust case. But of course, it turns out that antitrust regulations don't apply to the politics industry. Sadly, as I mentioned, the actors in the political system are thriving. But the people are, have never been more dissatisfied. And we see this in the congressional approval ratings. We see this in the never higher demand for a third party. Now, in any other industry, if you had more than 85% of people dissatisfied with the current supplier, with the current rivals, uh, the current companies in that industry, the Democrats and the Republicans, you would see new competition emerge. But we don't see that in politics. Because the one place the parties work well together is to erect barriers to entry. And now I'll turn it over to Michael. So in order to kind of un unpack and understand the nature of this dysfunctional rivalry uh, in politics, the rivalry that's not getting anything done, uh, the rivalry that's more about talk and not action, the rivalry that's more about false choices between partisan interests, not actually moving the country forward, to get at the underpinnings of that, we, uh, we, we applied uh, the, the, the thinking about industry structure and competition that has been utilized uh, throughout the economy to, uh, to try to understand you know, what the underlying drivers of competition and progress were all about. 
And this framework, uh, some of you may know, uh, is normally called the Five Forces Framework. And it, it says that in any industry, there's a number of fundamental competitive forces working. Uh, the most obvious is the direct head-to-head -head rivalry between the, the competitors. In this case, the, the competitors uh, being Republicans and Democrats. There's uh, no really new, new party or third party that's emerged in, in over 100 years. Uh, every industry has suppliers. Uh, uh, every industry uh, has customers. In this case, it's us, the citizens. Um, in many industries, we see distribution channels for the rivals to get their, get their message across to the citizens. And then, of course, uh, there's the threat of new company, new, newcomers. That would be a new party or uh, getting a fringe party to actually become a major party. Um, and then finally, substitutes. This is alternative ways of, of competing in our political system without actually being a party, something like an independent candidate, for example. What we understand now is when we unpack that industry structure, uh, we start to see a sort of complex set of actors who are working, uh, in most cases, collaboratively together uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to drive and, and, and cause the dysfunctional competition we see today. Uh, on the supplier side, there's all the things you need to run a modern campaign and, and, and to govern. Uh, what, we, what we found is those suppliers are all now captured by the parties. They're aligned with the parties. Um, and uh, any new player that wants to get in really has no access. Um, on, on the, uh, 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 the customers are segmented. Uh, there are multiple types of customers. Uh, there are five major customer segments. And what, what we find is that these customers have very different needs and very different interests. And the parties have chosen to serve some of these customer groups but pretty much ignore others. And average voters are one of the groups that they've ignored. Uh, the channels to reach uh, uh, customers are, are well known to most of you. Uh, they're, they're listed here. Um, many of those channels have long been controlled by the parties, making it very hard for somebody not part of the parties to get access to the citizens. Uh, but the, the, what used to be one of the bedrock channels that actually made our system work well was the independent media. But now we've seen that the independent media have to a large extent been captured by the parties. So they're just megaphones, uh, you know, kind of getting out the parties, the uh, partisan messages. Um, and, and very, very importantly, the barriers to entry to uh, bringing new competition in the industry, either a new party or even an independent candidate, have been built and built and built over time. And they're now, uh, you know, literally insurmountable. Even a, you know, a, a Mayor Bloomberg, uh, didn't even try to run as an independent because he concluded that it was pretty much impossible. So what is this, what is this led to? How has the duopoly really structured the competition in this industry to benefit them, but not the average citizen? Why do we see this huge disconnect? Well, uh, this slide try to, tries to give you a few of the highlights. And again, there's so much more nuance here. So I hope, uh, we hope that you will also take a look at the, the, the full report. This is not simple. And that's one of the reasons why uh, most people are so confused about what to do or even hopeless about what to do because it's so intricate and there's so many uh, rules that nobody really understands that uh, people just throw up their hands and say, it's always gonna be this way. So the basic competition model in, in a duopoly uh, is really manifested here in this industry. In a duopoly with two dominant competitors, the last thing the competitors wanna do is go head to head. So the parties are not targeting the average voter. They're actually targeting and dividing up the partisan and special interest voters. Uh, the people that care deeply about one issue or another, the people that are very ideologically oriented, and, and they sort of separated all the special interests in, into two groups. Those are the powerful customers. Those are the customers the parties listen to uh, and pay attention to. Uh, competition is on ideology, not solutions, not getting things done. Uh, uh, so much of the competition is blocking the other side, not doing anything at all. So much of the competition is false, uh, false choices that the citizens are presented with that actually don't make any sense. Uh, increasingly, the competition is, is based on creating fear and hostility to the other side. So it's Americans versus Americans. The, who is ruining our country is these Americans who want this versus us Americans who want that. A compromise is failure in this competitive model uh, because compromise would uh, disappoint the partisans and uh, ultimately uh, 
uh, uh, leave uh, the parties in, in, a, in, a, in a weaker and, and less clearly partisan position. And as Catherine said, uh, despite the bitter, bitter competition um, on, on partisan grounds, we also see the parties are able to cooperate to set the rules of the game that reinforce the way they're competing and dramatically raise the viewer's interest. Again, there's a complicated story here that we have to understand, but it starts with election rules, gerrymandering, partisan primaries. Um, um, you know, uh, it, it starts uh, you know, disadvantaging independents and other uh, new, uh, uh, new competitors, uh, governing rules in the House and the Senate that are really completely undemocratic and controlled by the parties. Um, and barriers to entry have been increased and increased and increased over time. Uh, we've not had a really significant new party uh, come into our system in well over 100 years. And you know, the fringe parties just never get anywhere. They don't even win a major election. Um, the net result of the way the duopoly competes is really three horrifying things that we discovered through this work. Number one, the parties actually don't want to solve the problems facing this country. That's not how they win. They win by feeding the, the kind of separation of their partisan interests. And if they solve a problem, that, that, that sort of demotivates the people that you know, are depending on them for you know, taking care of whatever they want. And, uh, um, and, 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 the, and the giving slows down and the support from the partisans uh, is eroded. Uh, so what a political system we've created, we've, we've allowed to be created that actually doesn't want to move the country forward. And, and that's exactly the way competition works today. There's no accountability for results. We can get, we've had decades of inaction on critical issues facing the country, but still, we still have the two major parties and they go back and forth a little bit, but, but ultimately, uh, you know, they're, they're not accountable. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're, they're, there's no new competition. And, and that's because of the high barriers to entry and, and the fact that you know, in, with, a, with a duopoly, your only choice as a voter is if you, you can't, don't vote for the Republicans, you gotta vote for the Democrats. And they're a very, very polar partisan choice. And so you only have these two choices and they're kind of completely separate from each other. So ultimately the net result is, is no accountability and the competitive dynamics of the industry have been captured and distorted so that there's really no countervailing forces here, which would restore healthy competition. There's no customer pressure, there's no supplier pressure, there's no channel pressure, uh, and there's no new entry. So with that, uh, the question is, what do we do about it? And that's something that we spent an enormous amount of energy on in, in our report, and, and Catherine uh, will talk about that. Thanks, Michael. Okay, what do we do? Very important to understand. There is a wide range of ideas that are talked about all the time in the reform and innovation community and in politics in general for things that we should fix. We created a very simple framework to determine which of those are actually worth the investment. And what we're looking for are reforms that are at the intersection of powerful and achievable. Meaning, for a reform to be powerful, it actually has to address one of the root causes that we uncovered in our analysis. It can't be just a nice idea that sounds good. It has to get at an incentive, at a rule of the game that's driving the behavior we see today. And then, at the same time, we also only want reforms that are achievable. Let me give you an example. There are many people who are spending time on constitutional amendments, and while that may be you know, possible over a span of decades, multiple decades, it's not achievable in any near-term sense, and therefore we didn't want to suggest that that's how we're going to drive the change. Fortunately, there are a number of reforms that exist in this intersection of powerful and achievable. I will note there are no reforms at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy, uh, but we've got several that are worth our time and investment and that we invite you to consider. So I'd like to run through a couple of the key ones. First of all, our reforms are in four areas, elections, governing, money, and then some near-term strategies that we can do to jumpstart competition before we change the fundamental rules and incentives in the game. I'll talk about three, the trifecta of reforms in the elections that we need. First of all, we've got to move to nonpartisan primaries. Nonpartisan primaries have been implemented in California, Washington, and already existed for some time in Louisiana. This is where 
voters in the primary would go to the polls on primary day and look at one ballot and every single candidate in that race would be on the same ballot. There's not a Democrat ballot and a Republican ballot. Off of that ballot, a single ballot, the top four vote getters advance to the general election. This avoids having the primaries constantly push Democrats further to the left and Republicans further to the right, which is a key impediment to getting anything done in Washington, DC. You combine that with nonpartisan redistricting, which helps avoid the phenomena of voter of, of candidates needing to go through their primaries and answering only to the far left or far right of their party if you reform both the primaries and the redistricting. Finally, we recommend the implementation of ranked choice voting in the general election. So you'll have your four candidates come out of the primary and then voters go in and say, I like them in this order. My first choice, my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice. If there's an instant runoff, the computer adds up the votes and only when one candidate reaches a majority of preference does that candidate win. So if in the first counting of those four candidates, they all got, you know, approximately 25%, but one got 22%, you drop off that last candidate, reallocate vote first place, reallocate those votes to the, those uh, voters second choice until you get a candidate that has majority support. This results in the selection of a candidate that has the broadest appeal to the most number of voters and enables them to go to Washington with an incentive to get things done and answer to a larger uh, group of people. Secondly, we need to reform the governing process, which is a change the way the rules of day-to-day -day legislating are uh, made and acted upon in Congress. And I won't get into money and politics now. I want to talk quickly about the last one, which is a really powerful strategy that is available to us as soon as 2018. So yes, long term, we have to change all these rules to create new competition and healthy competition. But in the meantime, here's something we can do, and it's called the Senate Fulcrum Strategy and advocated by a group called the Centrist Project, centristproject.org. Right now, in 2018, we could run and elect, for example, five independent, pro-problem-solving, consensus-driven US senators, and those five US senators would likely deny either party an outright majority creating therefore the most powerful swing coalition in Washington DC and serving as a fulcrum to actually align with one party or the other on various issues that confront the nation that Michael pointed out in the, uh, around the US business environment in the beginning and actually make progress on those issues immediately because these candidates would not be beholden to the duopoly. These are reforms that we would love to see the business community get engaged in for, as, for their businesses and personally. The situation that we find ourselves in brings to mind this quote from one of our founding fathers, John Adams, there's nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This is where we find ourselves today. It's delivering unhealthy competition on the wrong dimensions and dramatically hurting the future of our country. So the opportunity is for us to engage in these powerful and achievable reforms and make the difference that we all want to see for the country. Thank you, and we'll take your questions. Great, that was, that was perfect. Thank you, uh, Michael and Catherine. Um, I was reminded of uh, a quote, and I'm not sure where it came from originally. Uh, somebody said that, that the system is not broken, it's fixed. Um, so uh, I think we're ready to move I, on to questions. I will be repeating that. <laughs> it's a good one. All right, so we're ready to move on to questions. So if you are on your desktop, computer or laptop, um, you look at the bottom, there's a button that says participants. When you click on that, you should see a choice to raise hand. If you're on the mobile app, there's a choice that says more. If you click on that, it'll have a little button to say raise hand. And if you are calling in by phone, you can use uh, star nine, and that will let us know that you want to talk, okay? So hopefully some of you have questions. We're gonna try to take about 10 minutes here um, and see how many we can get through. Uh, Chris. Can you please tell me who has our first question? All right. Well, it is between an unknown number and another unknown number. So Maybe we can just read the last four digits and uh, they can tell right. us who they are. If your number ends in uh, 7894, you are the lucky caller. Go ahead. We can hear you. 
Oh, good. Thank you. Sorry. It's Paula Stern. Um, and uh, congratulations on your launch. Um, and I, I'm interested in the use of the term duopoly um, in contrast to the tribal politics that is described by, uh, particularly in the new book, uh, E.J. Dion and uh, Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, it's even worse than we thought and even messier than just a duopoly. Um, and uh, I'm wondering how, with all great respect, uh, Michael, for all of your wonderful work uh, on the corporate world, um, applicable it is to uh, the democratic situation which is uh, prevailing here in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so if you could, you know, I guess address the duopoly versus, if you will, tribal politics um, and, and the extent to which you feel that uh, some, there are political scientists out there that are kind of tracking your analysis as well. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Paula. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, I think there's no question that that within the parties, uh, everybody isn't the same. There are subgroups and subsegments uh, that are that are different, that are farther right or a little bit farther left, or what, whatever the differences are, have different views that they you know are particularly passionate about. Uh, different different slices of of, of liberal or, or conservative, but the dominant institutions, the dominant uh, barriers to entry, uh, the dominant uh, drivers of competition are really bimodal. Uh, they affect either the Republicans or the Democrats. And uh, uh, so in a sense, the real control of the industry is indeed the duopoly. It's the two parties uh, where it all comes together. And, um, and those two parties are jointly cooperating every single day to set the overall rules. Now, within the parties, you have chaos on occasion on one side or the other, but the point is that the net effect on competition is really fundamentally driven by the, the rules and the structures that, that are now really bifurcating the industry into these two dominant competitors. And there's nobody in the industry today of any significance that's not either a registered Democrat or a Democrat or a Republican. So uh, I think we can't get distracted by the little, you know, inter internal warfare that goes on within the parties. That's not the big message. Political scientists, we respect very greatly. We think they do great work, but they get they get sucked into these little details and don't understand the big competitive dynamic that's fundamentally driving this industry. In our report, we talk about how bit by bit, rule by rule, policy by policy, this industry has been eroding for 30 or 40 or 50 years. This, this dis disaster we see today has been coming. It's been coming slowly, uh, but it's been coming. And it's been coming because of the two parties and the choices that they've made. So ultimately, uh, uh, we take your point, uh, but on the other hand, I think if we don't deal with these party-driven rules and practices, uh, we're not gonna get very far. Great, thank you so much. All right, we're ready for the next question. Okay, our next question goes to uh, Tay Revez. Uh, take it away, Tay. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Um, I, have, I will preface this by saying that I have spent the last 20 plus years of my life working on voter-owned elections, public financing of campaigns in New York State, something that was actually thanks to Donald Trump's action on the side south. Um, I am really concerned by the huge amount of money unleashed by the Supreme Court decisions, but coming in from billionaires like the Kochs and the Mercers, where you now see a threat of primarying all Republican senators, and the money is there to do it. I mean, this is the Mercer money, which means unlimited money in low turnout primaries. So you could literally see a hostile Republican takeover of the entire Senate delegation. And you're coupling this with additional forays on the state level where we're seeing uh, money cross party lines to achieve. And if you get, for example, in 2018, 
a complete Republican takeover of the type they're trying. How fast are the rules going to change, and is there really time to resist this and do the kind of reforms you're talking about? Wait, wait, did you get the question, Catherine and Michael? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yes. So there's no question that money in politics is a huge problem. When we looked at what strategic set of comprehensive reforms we should recommend, we did include some reforms for money in politics. But we're not, we don't believe that's the first driver. And here's why. The real way you need to change the influence of money in politics is to change the return on investment that currently delivers so much to those who are donating for their own private purposes. You need to get rid of that return on investment and change the results that they're getting for the money they invest. Because if they didn't get results for that money, they wouldn't invest that money. In fact, people who are putting money into the system for their own private purposes, contrary to the public interest, would be perfectly happy for it to cost them one-tenth as much as it currently costs them to get the results that they want. So if we were able to cut the amount of money in politics, but not change the rules of the way the game is played, you actually, it would just be cheaper for those people trying to influence elections and policy for the wrong reasons. So therefore, we're focused on the powerful and achievable election reforms that change the incentives that the political, that the elected officials respond to. Let me give you an example. In the, in the end, if a politician could get donations that total $10 million, let's say, but they couldn't get reelected through their primary, they're not gonna be for what that $10 million is for, because they can't get reelected or they, so what we wanna do is change the primary system so that they have to answer to the voters in order to get reelected instead of currently, they just need to answer to the money because that works in the, in the two partisan primaries that we currently have. Once we change the rules of the game, we can follow that with more reforms in bringing money out of politics and that can make a difference. Right now, the only way to go after that in a big way is a constitutional amendment, which also doesn't reach our uh, criteria for being achievable. That's a great question and thank you for fielding that one. I wish we had more time. We do have a couple more questions, but we do have to move on to our next section. So thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Catherine. This has been really uh, interesting and I think um, a lot of people are going to follow up by reading the rest of the report because uh, it's great, great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us.